All right, we're going to get started. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce to you uh, Dal Upton. It is also a rather daunting task for me in some ways because I want to do justice uh, to the importance of his work, which is uh, enormous in, in my field of study. Um, Dal Upton is professor of architectural history at the Art History Department at UCLA. And he told me to keep this introduction short, which, which is, a, is a challenge, considering the many books that uh, Bell has written. Um, but perhaps uh, what best characterizes, for me, his approach is the true interdisciplinary nature of his work. Uh, and I think uh, Bell is one of the few uh, people, I think, in architectural history who is really able to bridge uh, things that, that are often uh, disconnected, the history of architecture uh, uh, through the history of cities, uh, the history of material culture to uh, to very kind of uh, small uh, small scale, right? So, so his work really ranges uh, uh, across the many scales uh, that we uh, as architects uh, often forget uh, exist. Uh, uh, Dell is uh, versed in not just in architectural history, in art history, but also in anthropology, archaeology, and history, or, or history history, as architectural historians sometimes I call it. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to characterize what uh, is, are the many contributions of his work, uh, but I think uh, those may be threefold. Uh, and my, maybe that's a general strategy of mine to always divide problems into subsets, and the number three always comes up as the best way to organize these things. So three, uh, three ways in which his work has contributed, first of all, in American architectural history, uh, with a, a range of books, I'm just going to name the titles, Another City, Urban Life and Urban Spaces in the New American Republic in 2008, Architecture in the United States, which many of you uh, should actually know because that was the textbook we used for my class, and I think many of you are here, which is great. Uh, Holy Things and Profane Ameri uh, Anglican Parish Churches in Colonial Virginia in 1986, uh, Madeline Loved uh, and Survival and, in Antebellum and New Orleans, and a book uh, which is forthcoming uh, on civil rights and black history monuments and urban politics in the U.S. South, uh, entitled Memorials to the C Second Civil War, uh, Civil Rights Monuments and Southern Urban Politics. So I think this is uh, Bell's formidable contribution to American architectural history, but I don't think that's uh, quite enough. I think Dell has also uh, been foundational to what we call vernacular architecture studies, the, the study of architecture uh, that is uh, very often uh, marginalized or not present in a lot of discourse in schools of architecture. Uh, uh, so I think that's also a, a really key contribution to help us think about the built environment in its, in its very large sense, right? Not just the buildings that have an author attached to them, but uh, 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 the kind of mundane, everyday environments in which we live and work as well. He's the co-founder of VAF, the Vernacular Architecture Forum. Uh, uh, books in this, in this uh, domain uh, include Common Places, Readings in American Vernacular Architecture, and America's Architectural Roots, Ethnic Groups that Built America. Finally, uh, a third uh, dimension of his work, and I think the one that, that uh, is, is more recent, I think, is the global history of architecture, uh, uh, which is a kind of new or renewed field in the history of architecture that tries to look beyond a kind of uh, isolated set of individual civilizations in the history of architecture and look at uh, global connections and the global uh, uh, kind of dimensions of modernity, and in that, uh, uh, Direction, Dell is working on a book uh, uh, tentatively, I think tentatively, entitled A World uh, History of Architecture with uh, James and Hudson. And I cannot wait for it to come out so I can uh, use it in my own classes. All right, today's talk is entitled uh, Concrete Modernity. And I think what we'll see today is a very different uh, view from what we are normally uh, uh, trained to, uh, uh, to, 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 to apply in architecture. I look on a very uh, simple material, a very common material, uh, at least to us architects, uh, <coughs> namely concrete, 
And we'll look at its relationship to modernity, but very different than what I think we're normally used to. So I, I don't think we will uh, learn today about Corbusier and other uh, uh, architects uh, 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 tend to take the spotlight, but instead look at a very different uh, alternative to you to understand those relationships. So please uh, welcome me, and, and, uh, wel uh, join me, sorry, in welcoming Gal Hoffman. Well, thank you, Kenny, and uh, for that very generous introduction, and thank you to the university for inviting me twice. Oops, what did we do? We lost something here. I must have hit something that I shouldn't have. Oh, okay. All is, all is restored. Um, this is the beginning of a new project, and it starts from a group of very humble artifacts that I began to look at while I was working at the end of working on my book on civil rights monuments. And those artifacts are gravestones. Let's see, it's made for right-handers. But we all know that all the smartest people are left-handed, right? <coughs> but, hmm. oh, these, okay, okay. <laughs> this is a very high-tech talk. Uh, what I'm looking at are gravestones that are ho homemade, for the most part, that are made out of concrete, that are found in African-American cemeteries in the rural south, and uh, in some, some urban areas as well. These are stones like this are, I've been seeing across the country for many years, uh, across the nation, across the continent for many years. But I always saw them as, as curiosities. You can find them made by members of many eth ethnic groups. There's a, a Latino one from New Mexico and a, a French one from the far northern Quebec. Um, but the more I saw these ones in the South, the more I thought about how one might see them. Uh, because there are certain things about them. First of all, the fact that they're made out of concrete, which as we know has a peculiar resonance in 20th century architectural discourse. Um, concrete, reinforced concrete, or, or ferro-concrete as it used to be called, uh, was touted by modernists as one of the new materials along with iron and steel and glass that were going to transform architecture, uh, that would transform it in a variety of ways. It would create, allow the creation of dynamic new architectural forms that were never possible before, forms that would demonstrate human mastery of the material world, human, uh, the freedom, human freedom from the mundane constraints of the material world. Um, this photograph of Centennial Hall, one of the, the masterpieces of early modern architecture, is very telling in that sense. We look at this photograph and we compare it with a more modern photograph. The, photo, the black and white photograph uh, um, is, is a, clearly uh, what takes what's basically a dome on pendentives, not that much different from a building like the Hagia Sophia, um, and, it, and photographs it in order to, to represent a kind of dynamic asymmetry. Um, so uh, the, the, the medium of black and white photograph, photography itself minimizes the d distinctions among surfaces and spaces, and so it enforces this kind of romantic visual conception of what uh, the author of this book uh, from the 1920s about the ferro-concrete style uh, 
uh, the reinforced concrete style of, of building, thought art concrete made possible. There's also another goal in concrete, and one that we sometimes forget when we talk about modern architecture, and that is the, the goal of establishing the architect as the supreme authority in building. Uh, the architect free from what architects thought of as the tyranny of, of skilled craftsmen. Uh, Peter Collins and, and other people have, have argued that, that modern concrete has, had its origins in Pise, in rammed earth, uh, an ancient globally distributed kind of building technology. Rammed earth, uh, Pise was promoted in late 18th century France as a progressive building technology. It gets distributed through publications. Uh, it, it appears in the English language in books for farmers, uh, uh, telling farmers how they could, could, could use it to avoid the cost of hiring skilled craftsmen, to avoid, uh, to employ their farm workers throughout the year, because this is supposedly a technology that anyone could make and yet it, it produced very, very solid and, and, and useful buildings. These are, on the bottom left, you see one of a series of slave quarters built by a man named John Hartwell Cock, or built for him in Virginia. Uh, Cock was, was, was tied into this progressive farming uh, uh, ideology, and he built, had the slave quarters and others of the outbuildings on his farm. His house was a big, Palladian mansion, uh, but these were built, uh, he, he thought, as a, way, as a way of tying into this ideology of profess, progressive farming. Um, as, as, as Col in Collins, Peter Collins traces very carefully the, the evolution of Pise and these kinds of construction into what we now call concrete. And as concrete, uh, it becomes part of the logic of capitalist production that was explored by Harry Braverman 40 years ago, and that is the, the separation of headwork from handwork, uh, the removal of skill from the people who actually do the work, centralization of skill and, and authority in a few heads. Um, unfortunately, as, as, as some architectural writers noted, noted this uh, Siegfried Gideon uh, among them, that this centralization of authority not only eliminated the tyranny of the skilled worker, it also eliminated the tyranny of the architect, who became in Gideon's terms an embarrassment. Uh, and Gideon wrote, a building's actual control, despite possible exterior mutilation, meaning architectural elaboration, belonged to the engineer, and behind the engineer, industrialized building production. So another goal of, of, of concrete uh, of, of people who saw concrete as, as a, an important new material was to make inexpensive, solid building available to more people. Um, here's a magazine published in the early 20th century for the contractor, the farmer, the homeowner, and the smaller user of concrete. So concrete was supposedly a material that, as with Pise, didn't require skill. So architects thought that would give them more control over the building process, but the other side of it was that would allow more people to do their own building. Um, and those, those latter two goals were realized in the sense that uh, concrete has become the most ubiquitous uh, building material globally. Adrian Forty, uh, 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 this, these are uh, concrete, cast concrete blocks. You could buy a machine from Sears Roebuck uh, in the early 20th century from other people, put the concrete into it and make a concrete block. The, the, the reasoning being that just as easily as a standard block, like the one on the top left, you could make ones that had patterns on them and make your house look like it was built out of stone or whatever. Frank Lloyd Wright here at the Friedman House in, in 1924, and it, many of his, his, his experiments in cast concrete block uh, uh, building, the idea was the same. He would create the pattern for the blocks and the owner would, would, uh, would pour them and build his or her own house. And you can see this was heavily damaged by, by an earthquake in 1994 and you can see the, the uh, rebars that run through to, to lace the blocks together, uh, hence Wright's name of, of textile blocks. Uh, it, so in, in his, his new book on, on 
uh, concrete, Adrian Forty talks about concrete being the most widely used material on Earth apart from water. Uh, about 2.5 tons of concrete are, create, are manufactured annually for every human being on Earth. Uh, so concrete is one of the, the production of concrete, the production of the materials that go into concrete are among the most serious polluters uh, in, in destroyers of the environment today. So one of the, the, the omnipresent uh, the, or the most striking manifestations of this kind of global use of concrete uh, is the, the self-built reinforced concrete frame building that you find in virtually every part of the, of the world. Usually these are eternally un, unfinished. The rebars stick out the top. Uh, most people say that you, you hear the, you encounter the urban legend that this is because you don't pay taxes on an unfinished building. Uh, but in fact, it really speaks to the, the uh, eternally progressing, the eternally uh, in progress conception of these buildings. They are never, they are never mentally finished uh, either. So on the, on the one hand, we have, we have these reinforced concrete buildings, um, part of that modern industrial phenomenon of the displacement of expertise. Um, just as it's displaced to the head of the architect, in that ideal form that I mentioned earlier. Here it's displaced, building expertise is displaced to factories wherever um, labor and materials are available so that it can be exported as a kind of, 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 of virtual labor to places that don't have materials or labor uh, to, to produce on this scale. In the 19th century, this, this displacement um, of labor begins in the 19th century uh, with the export by European nations to European colonies of things like free prefabricated buildings or corrugated iron, which is very strong and, and very compact and can be shipped in, in large numbers uh, to, to their colonies. This is a, an ad for an iron emigrant's cottage from England in 1851 on the bottom. And on the top is one of those cottages built in South Melbourne in Australia. So we can think of, of corrugated iron as the concrete of the 19th century. So that 19th century manufacturers are shipping this kind of virtual labor across the oceans. In the 20th century, the widespread, uh, 20th and 21st century, the widespread manufacture of cement enables the same kind of displacement of labor, of capital, from the place that is, it is practiced, the place that it's manufactured, to distant sites. So you have the practice, for example, of remittance houses in Mexico, where Mexican immigrants in the US send back money to, to their homes. The money is used to, build, to buy building materials, which is almost always concrete, that are amassed on the site until the person is able to, to come build uh, his house. Um, or these, again, these reinforced concrete frames, often filled with concrete block that you see all over the world. So here, displacement of labor is not geographical so much as it is across class lines. Uh, and, and in this picture from, from central Syria, I would call your attention to the foreground, to the adobe building with the wooden uh, vigas, we'd call them in the southwest, wooden rafters that stands next to the earlier kind of building technology that stands next to the concrete building. Um, one common way to think about these concrete buildings, such as the one you see here, is under the rubric of the vernacular or the death of tradition. Um, using words, the vernacular, the death of tradition or tradition as antonyms of modern and modernity. That somehow when we b begin building concrete buildings and stop building earth buildings, um, tradition has died. Uh, part of that discourse is to talk, talk about an apparent global homogenization, uh, the entire world being, being covered with these self-built concrete buildings. 40, uh, in Forty's study of concrete, he's very an ambivalent about them. He says, uh, to classify reinforced concrete of this sort as either modern or non-modern is not particularly appropriate. As one of the new technologies of poverty, and he put that phrase in, in quotation marks, it belongs to, to neither category. 
So either way we look at these as modern or non-modern, as, as uh, continuing the vernacular or as the death of tradition, fit very nicely into contemporary discussions of modernity in architecture. So concrete represents either a glorious new future uh, for architecture, or it represents the degradation of a more humane environment. So what I want to do tonight, what I'm trying to do tonight, is, is to deepen this discussion by asking, first, is it possible to be modern outside the formal discourse of modernity? Um, is modernity a, a phenomenon that's restricted to a single segment of society? Are the poor, as Forty suggests, outside the discourse of modernity, outside the realm of modernity? Do they exist in a kind of timeless space that was once romanticized as tradition and that now gets compartmentalized uh, in passages like 40s as a culture of poverty? So these concrete gravestones that I'm interested in address this question, these questions very directly. Um, the fact that they are in the southern United States, the southeastern United States, the fact that they were made by and for black people complicate the problem, I think, in an interesting way because it makes one conscious of the ingrained ways that we want to see them. We want to see them. Uh, our first impulse is to see them in a sentimentalized way that describes them as folk art or that describes them perhaps as traditional forms corrupted like the Syrian buildings, corrupted by modern materials like concrete. This romanticization of, of the American South as a pre-modern place has, has shaped or, or misshaped, I would say, our perceptions of its landscape and history since the, the 19th century. Uh, and to explain what I mean, I'd like to take a little side excursion into the work of a contemporary photographer, uh, William Christenberry. Um, he, he's a wonderful photographer. He was born in Greensboro uh, in Hale County, Alabama, uh, one of Alabama's poorest counties and what's known as the Black Belt, called that not for, for the, the predominantly African-American population, but called that for the, the color of the very rich soil that made it a, a, a a heavily occupied plantation region in the 19th century. But, but Kristen Berry is a faculty member in the art school at Corcoran, uh, the Corcoran Gallery in Washington. He was trained as a painter. He photographs as when he went home to Hale County, when it, he still does, when he goes home to Hale County since the 60s, he's photographed the same buildings over and over and over again as a way of chronicling their chronicling their translation, their transformation over time. Um, this is one of his most famous photographs. It's the Palmas building. And in his series of photographs, it gradually collapses until finally in the last photograph, it's a vacant lot. Um, it's worth considering how people treat the images that Kristen Berry produces. They treat him as an authentic Southerner, as a, uh, uh, and, and as an authentic Southerner, as a kind of transparent lens on, uh, who reveals some very deep truths about Southern life. Uh, if you look at, uh, Aperture publishes a series of, of very important monographs on, on contemporary photographers. If you look at the first one uh, called William Christenberry Southern Photographs, which came out in 81, the critic who introduced it says, uh, claims that the closeness of family and the Southern way of life make his, mark his work. Both grandmothers cooked on wood stoves, and at daybreak the houses filled with the smells of fresh baked biscuits, homegrown ham and sausage, and cornbread with ribbon cane syrup. After working for an hour or so in the cotton patch for spending money, he and his uncles fished the Black Warrior River a cedar bucket filled with fresh spring water to be drunk from a gourd dipper, was always waiting on the porch for family or visitors. It makes you want to break out into a chorus of zippity doo -dah. Um, And this is universally the narrative in, uh, which he encourages, the narrative that is supposed to explain his photographs. It's seen as the root of his photographic sensibility. Another aperture collection from 2010 uh, 
has a, has a, 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 a different critic wrote in, in the introduction, no one had instructed him to pre-visualize a scene according to the dictates of a grayscale. And he never felt a calling to roam the streets and seize life on the fly. The fractious debates about glossy versus matte papers and cropping versus full frame that split the photographic community in the middle decades of the 20th century did not disturb his hermetic life in a Memphis painting studio. His mind was clear and open. So here's a man who is a trained artist, um, a very self-conscious artist, who is presented and who presents himself as a kind of naive recorder of a very peculiarly Southern reality. Uh, so this, the South that, that um, the photographs revealed to, to critics of Kristen Berry's work seemed to be the elusive and mysterious South of William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, uh, Eudora Welty, perhaps a touch of James Dickey's deliverance in there. Um, Walker Percy, who was a, was a New Orleans novelist whose family were from Mississippi, said Kristen Berry's photographs were poetic evocations of a haunted countryside. So if we look at the Palmist building, we see the, the palm sign is upside down. It's placed in the broken windows of this, of this ramshackle building. Um, it perhaps suggests the past. It perhaps suggests a distant past that's, that's receding even as the building is receding, a sort of mysterious past. Um, uh, but it's also, uh, uh, a, this sign is also for Christenberry a commodity that has urban cultural cachet. And in uh, all of his, 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 his photographs have stories that are attached to them uh, that he tells over and over every time he gives a talk. And he's recently published a book of those narratives that explain his photographs. And he tells you in his narratives that he spent 30 years trying to get this sign, trying to buy it, um, to put in his studio. Uh, 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 as a kind of cultural capital. U ultimately, he, he did get it but, it, but it was touch and go for a long time. Well, Kristen Berry, in the history of photography, in the history of art, Kristen Berry has been depicted as an heir to the documentary photographers of the 1930s. People like Dorothea Lang or like Arthur Rothstein and especially Walker Evans. And as a nice, convenient biographical coincidence, Evans was working with James Agee in Hale County, where, where Kristen Berry was born, in the month that Kristen Berry was born there. Um, and what Evans later encouraged in, in the 60s, Kristen Berry first began photographing as just a kind of hobby. Uh, he thought of himself as a painter, and Evans encouraged Kristen Berry to take his photography seriously as an art form. So scholars, when scholars look at these interwar documentarians, um, they th look at them as observers, uh, as, as one, one critic wrote in, in the introduction to a, to a Christenberry volume, as observers of the proliferation of goods and the growth of consumer society in the 1920s and 30s on the American landscape. So Christenberry, as the, the heir of these photographers, sees himself as following this same story deeper into time, making, marking, uh, again, a critic's comment, marking the spread across the rural south of objects painted in inorganic pigments and the various ways they complemented or clashed with the organic scheme, color scheme, of the Hale County soil and vegetation. So as I say, Kristen Berry allows himself to be seen in this way. Um, he says, I was always attracted by the warped shapes of rustic smaller buildings and houses, the ways they have been molded, altered by time, even though he admits that it's not true. Um, his mother complains to him, son, everyone is going to think Alabama is a rusted, worn out place based on your work. He says, well, yes, that's true, but the kinds of buildings you like, Ma, are too accessible. I don't like to photograph those. So um, in keeping with this, this point of view of these photographers from the 30s who, whose tradition he carries on, uh, but also artists and novelists and folklorists uh, who have been interested in the so-called vanishing old America. Um, Kristen Berry bemoans his passing. One of the things he says that unfortunately the churches, the wonderful country churches, are disappearing, being replaced by cinder block churches. 
So here's a, uh, a church that he photographed several times, a wooden church in the background, with its replacement, a concrete block or cinder block church uh, in, in the front of it. One way to, to think about this comment, to think about this ethos, is as a version of what planners, the planner Ananya Roy referred to as the aestheticization of poverty. Um, it distresses us when we, and it distresses Kristen, Kristen Berry and many of us who have inherited that aesthetic to see rural people, um, mostly but not entirely black people, uh, whose, whose landscape he's photographing, relinquishing their rickety, unair conditioned, unheated, falling down, but picturesque churches in favor of solid, heatable, coolable, cheap concrete block churches that provide some of the, co of the comforts that we take for granted. Um, we want them to remain in that old wooden church and not build this new concrete block church. Now, by a useful, useful coincidence, some of Kristen Berry's favorite subjects stand in a little hamlet called New Bern, Alabama. Um, here are three, three buildings that he's photographed over and over and over. So the next step, just like the, the coincidence of Walker Evans working in Greensboro at this time that Kristen Berry was born, New Bern, Alabama happens to be the site of Auburn University's rural studio, headquartered in these very buildings, where students uh, design and build houses, uh, and in recent years, many other kinds of buildings, filled with trendy architecture student ideas for rural residents. Um, rural studio, as most of you know, I'm sure, was founded by a man named Samuel Mockby. And Mockby began his career, he tells us, thinking about how to house low-income rural people. And that's one of the, the impetuses for the creation of Rural Studio. But there's another impetus that's at least as strong, because Mockby also depicts himself as an artist, an artist who is deeply engaged with cosmopolitan aesthetic discourse of high design. So at Rural Studio, the, the aesthetics of the housing is as important as the quality of the housing. Mockby wrote, the goal is not to have a warm, dry house, but to have a warm, dry house with a spirit to it. So one way we might critique these buildings is to say they're inappropriate to the clients, that they bring the, an urban, high design aesthetic to traditional rural people. But by the argument that I'm trying to make today, that would be an erroneous uh, criticism. What they do instead, that I think is a problematic, is they aestheticize their clients' aesthetic limitations. Um, they aestheticize rural poverty just as Kristen Berry does when he aestheticizes old rickety wooden churches over concrete block ones. So when we look at the early works of, of the rural studio, um, they use scavenged, stereotypically rural materials, hay bales, found stones, old lumber, shells of abandoned buildings as their materials. Or here, this, this windshield uh, community, community center made out of windshields, uh, I think of as kind of standing as in the same relationship to the clients as Venturi did in putting a TV antenna on the top of Guildhouse and saying that's because old people watch television all the time. Uh, so rural people like to ride around their pickup trucks all the time. Um, so in other words, what they're doing is they're using in their buildings materials that they see as appropriate to rural southern life, to this a romanticized version of rural southern life. They're aestheticizing this imagined uh, tradition of poverty. And it's worth noting in the context of what we're looking at today that what Mockby intended to build for himself and his students there, he died before it could be built, but his, his daughter built it, is this, something called the Sub Rosa Pantheon, uh, a little postmodern neoclassicism with maybe a, a dash of James Turrell in there. Um, using the concrete, using the rebar of global modernity. Um, so what's wrong with the rural studio approach then is that it posits the, the students and Mockby himself as modern and the clients as non-modern. It doesn't give them credit for their own modernity. So the, the rural studio become 
a kind of aesthetic missionary. Um, they're missionaries, though, who don't trust their congregation to convert completely and who would, in fact, be a little sad if they did. Uh, they want them to remain in that relationship. So that begins to turn us back to our starting point. So we step back to, to Christenberry and look at his photographs uh, and other works in a way that helps us to understand that rural modernity, uh, understand the concrete gravestones. Here are two models that he, he, he makes models, they're usually about that big, of things that he's photographed. And he says, um, and, and those, those are, are, are significant. With no exceptions that I know, everything that Christenberry photographs is a 20th century building. He's photographing a rural South that has already been transformed by the New South movement of the late 19th century into an urbanized, industrialized, commercialized world. So when he makes these models, he says he makes these models because he wants to possess them. He sees them as not as elements of the landscape, but as, as commodities. So here we have a building covered with corrugated, which I described as the concrete of the 19th century and early 20th century. That is a building who, whose, all, whose visual, ev visual elements are made industrially. And here we have a kind of imaginary building covered with the kinds of signs that Kristen Berry likes to collect, Coke signs and signs for various kinds of drinks and so on and so on. So those, then, those are also, those are in themselves manufactured objects and they also advertise urban commercial goods. These are the subjects of the sculptures. So even though the critic says what he's photographing are these intrusions into the, in, into the landscape, what Christenberry is really interested in is those intrusions. So he's not interested in change so much as he's interested in, uh, in the outcome of change. Uh, so when I look at Christenberry's work, I think not of a kind of vanishing Arcadia, I think of, I'm reminded of the fact that that Arcadia never existed. Uh, the American South, even though in popular culture it's seen as inherently anti-modern, is already, by the time Kristen Berry and Evans and those people come, already in the 19th century, penetrated by industrial production, penetrated by the consumer networks of the 1930s. The, the traditional South, if it ever existed, was not going at the time Evans and later Kristen Berry photographed them, but it's already gone. Uh, it had been a modern place since the 19th century. So what we see in Kristen Berry's photographs, or Evans's photographs, is not uh, the end of the mysterious Faulknerian South, again, if it ever, that ever existed, but the adolescence of the modern South, the, a, a South on its way to becoming the suburban South of the, of the present. So now we come to the second issue about these, these concrete stones. That is, they're southern, but also that the ones that I look at, the ones that exist in, in greatest numbers, were made by and for African Americans. And that's significant because African Americans have a central role, both in the old romantic story of the South and in the newer one that I'm telling. Uh, in the old role, roles, blacks carry the burden of the unmodern. They are creatures who are presented as apparently impervious to the commercial modernity that engulfs them. So here we have Dorothea Lange's, um, Lange's photograph of Negroes lounging around a plantation store, and you see that some torn advertising signs for products, and you see a shiny new car on the left. Uh, but the black people seem not to be, to be part of that. Um, uh, they're, they're, the, the title itself says that black African Americans treated as inherently inert, as, as people waiting to be told, like you would tell a mule. Um, they're part of the natural landscape in this kind of imagery more than they're part of the human landscape. This all grows out of a very explicit late 19th century white supremacist view of black character. Um, that blacks are not people who have initiative or who are part of, of, of uh, so social progress. So when you get well-intentioned white photographers in the 30s like Lang, like Walker Evans, even though in, in, in particular photographs you can see that they, 
They convey a certain kind of dignity to individual African Americans. Uh, on the whole, they, they perpetuate these white supremacist arguments about African Americans as non-participant observers of commercial culture. Whenever you see blacks engage in commercial culture, they're always flummoxed by it. It's almost like a minstrel show, that these black guys who can't get their car to run. Uh, that that, that the, 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 this, this image conveys to you not black people being modern and having a car, but black people who, uh, who, are, who, who are losers in the struggle with, with modern technology. This kind of unconscious acceptance of white supremacist premises continues in the 40s and 50s, 60s, 70s with uh, the search among folklorists and anthropologists for what are called African American, Africanisms, rather. Um, Melville Herskovitz's uh, famous rejection of the white supremacist argument that Africans have no culture uh, goes the, the other way and tries to find uh, Africa, uh, African American, everything that African Americans do in America as being African. So things like grave goods, putting beds on graves, piling up uh, people's, uh, people's former possessions on their graves that you see in these two cem cemeteries, one that photographed by, uh, by Christenberry. Folklorists trace this back to West African burial practices, uh, and then from there to the sea islands of, of South Carolina and Georgia, and then to the inland. And what I'm, not, what I'm saying is not that there are no connections to, to African culture, but that these are overemphasized. We get a kind of romanticization of African Americans as fundamentally non-modern bearers of a fundamentally African tradition that makes no attempt to situate these practices within the broader patterns of Southern life or black life. So it turns, uh, again, inadvertently, it turns African Americans into a kind of throwback African natives of the sort that white supremacists always claimed they were. So, for example, when Christenberry photographs this graveyard cross made out of eggshells, um, egg cartons rather, he says, I'd thought it was a black congregation, meaning the owners of the cemetery, because it seemed to me that black people made the most interesting objects out of what they had at hand, but it turned out to be a poor white community. In fact, um, African Americans were deeply embedded in the modern economy of the South and the First. This is, a, um, to some of you, this will be a familiar image. Dockery Farms was a, uh, a plantation in central Mississippi that many famous blues musicians like Charlie Patton and Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters worked at. And you often see this image, which is uh, right next to the road, this gin building presented as, as a kind of sign for Dockery Farms and a sign for the, the, the traditional culture that these guys grew up in. But this, these are industrial buildings of an industrialized commercial agriculture of the early 20th century, which is why Charlie Patton and Muddy Waters and Robert Johnson and many other people worked there. They were part of that, the industrial agriculture, uh, agricultural system. And in fact, blacks were essential to this New South industrialization project this modernized, rationalized view of the South, the Jim Crow racial order created a pool of urban and rural industrial serfs um, and justified by, a kind of, by pseudoscientific theories of racial difference. So even though the romance of the South and the romance of African American culture uh, uh, covers the fact, African Americans were immersed in the Southern industrial commercial consumption society of the South since Reconstruction. Here is a photograph by a late 19th century white Virginia photographer named George Cook. You can see the title of the, uh, of the photograph is meant to convey one thing, but if you look closely at the photograph, you see household goods, you see a bed, you see a pot, you see uh, p photographs from commercial publications all things that come out of the commercial industrial society, the guy's hat, um, possibly the woman's, woman's clothes. But these are people who are living in, in modern society, not, who, are not, who are not colorful, backward people um, suggested by the dialect, by dialect title. So 
the gravestones, the concrete gravestones are really integral to that landscape. Um, first of all, they tell us about consumption. Um, the consumption of building materials like concrete block that spread through the South in the early 20th century. The consumption of mag manufactured objects like the ones we saw in the last photograph. The use of industrial materials and objects in grave markers. So in these two markers, the, the marker on the left, you can see that the, um, the name is pressed in by cast metal letters, or per, uh, perhaps cast wood. And you see that quite often. You rarely see uh, the impressions of the, the factor, as art historians like to call it so clearly. You can tell by the alignment and the form of the letters that they're cast, but usually the person has a somewhat lighter hand, so you don't have to see the shapes of the blocks. On the right, you see a concrete stone that uh, this angel, and later you'll see a, a finger on the same stone, you see these all over, and clearly people buy the molds for these uh, in, in order to make the little decorations. Uh, especially in rural areas, we're seeing the ability to consume, but we're also seeing the limits of consumption. Uh, people are at the very edge of their ability to consume. So these concrete blocks are all mark graves uh, in this cemetery in rural South Carolina. Uh, in that same cemetery, when we come across a, a platter stuck in the ground as a marker, if we take the romanticized view, the impulse might be to interpret this as a kind of Africanism. Uh, if we take uh, the other view, I would interpret it as someone saying, well, this platter is nicer than a concrete block. Uh, and so I'll mark the grave in this way. When we look at, look at these things in the aggregate, when we look at the patterns on them, when we look at the groupings of them, uh, again, the idea of modernity is reinforced. Concrete markers in any given rural cemetery tend to be made from between one and 20 years, for between one and 20 years, for one family or a small group of families, judging by the, by the last names. They tend to be of one or a few shapes. And this suggests to me that, that they are the products of single people who have access to concrete and who have developed some sort of skill in working with it. I mean, you can't, you can't uh, if you've ever played with concrete, if you pr put the letters in too soon, they sink in. If you put them in too late, you can't make any impression. So these are very, very, very skilled objects. These, when these stop, they tend to stop, I believe, when either when that maker dies or when the, the uh, community reaches a, an economic horizon where more people are able to afford commercial stones. But they also suggest a modern sense of selfhood that's not reduced by poverty, but only um, limited in its expression. Um, they express individuality that is expressed in other ways, participation of African Americans after emancipation in institution building. So you notice in the image on the right, there's a Masonic sign. Um, even though this is semi-literate stone, the last line I think says, all wrapped in Jesus. Uh, but this, this guy, Preston DeWeiss, is participating in the Masons. He's participating in these kinds of modern fraternal uh, orders. Uh, these are the kinds of institutions that white supremacism uh, of the late 19th century was intended to destroy. A good kind of, kind of synoptic example of this is this cemetery in New Orleans, Holt Cemetery, a black cemetery that goes back to the to the 1850s, what you see here is the cemetery in 1999. Almost everything you see here was removed in, by Hurricane Katrina. Um, but it's a cemetery that when you walk around it, you realize that it exists almost entirely outside the commercial funerary industry of America, funeral consumerism. The, gr the hollowness of the graves show that people are not buried in concrete vaults. They're not buried, uh, they're either buried in wooden caskets or no caskets. Um, they are mostly buried under homemade markers um, that uh, just a few commercial ones, the one on the left made out of plywood, PVC pipe. Uh, the one on the right sawn out of plywood for a guy who had a hit record at one time, but he's there under these bricks and, and uh, this, this note. So, what this suggests is you're outside of that fairly expensive world of consumer funerals, 
but not completely outside consumption and certainly not outside the personal experience of modernity. That the, the, the very use of markers, marking individual graves, is testimony to this. Uh, in, until well into the 19th century, uh, after the re 18th century rather, after the Reformation, personal lies permanent marked graves were the prerogative of those who had uh, high ascribed status. That is people who were born into importance as opposed to achieving importance. Uh, in European and many American cemeteries, most dead people would either be buried uh, in unmarked or ephemerally marked graves for a certain period of time and in cemeteries, once the, their, uh, once the, the worms had done their duty, uh, their bones would be transferred to an ossuary, a charnel house, so that the grave could be reused. But there's a trend over the 18th century toward the personal marking of more and more graves, or at least identifying people's burial places. So that with this stone here, this stone is made because this guy was important, and you see his family, his family crest on it. But Increasingly in the 18th century, simply to have been a person who lived um, is increasingly worthy of having a marked grave, um, regardless of your lineage or, 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 or status in the, in the community. There's another element, and that's the economic element. That is, um, whatever in communities of any ethnicity, of any region, the desire to commemorate personal identity is inflected by things like the availability of materials and the availability of skills in the local economy. Um, so that here's a, a, a fairly modern wooden cross in, in northern Quebec and a um, 17, crudely carved 17th century stone in, in Rhode Island, um, both of which mark the person's grave, but they'll, they'll never, well, I was going to say they'll never last long, but 300 years is probably long. Uh, but they don't have that kind of elaboration and, and so on that, that uh, a, a professionally carved stone will have. So if we look at the African-American community in the South, until emancipation, most enslaved people were forbidden to, to express any sense of personal identity. For example, they were official non-people. Um, as an example, uh, Legally, black people couldn't have last names. But occasionally we find examples that show us that there were personal senses, senses of personal identity. Um, that what, what is lacking in the African Amer Southern African American community before emancipation is the ability to express this sense of identity in material form rather than the identity itself. So, what concrete gravestones represent is a kind of moving economic horizon where more and more people uh, farther and farther down the economic scale uh, are able to express that increased personal and, and racial or class conscious, uh, consciousness um, uh, with, with these new materials. They're, they're a stage on that movement toward manifesting selfhood. So here's a cemetery that shows you in the background the earlier kinds of stones, unmarked, rough, not lettered, marking individual graves. Then you have the intermediate stage of uh, these, these uh, homemade concrete gravestones where you can mark them, you can letter them. Then finally you have at the, at the far right a commercially purchased stone. So we're looking at three economic stages of grave marking and then on the far left uh, as a kind of, kind of outlier, this stone kind of stone that the military supplies to people who have been in the military. Um, so what these concrete stones do, they stand at an intersection of individualistic identity, of the ability to acquire consumer goods, in this case concrete, uh, of popular culture imagery, uh, like the, the fingers and, and cherubs that you see on many carved stones, and importantly, particularly in rural areas, the spread of literacy, uh, that, that the concrete stones often mark the first time that anyone could write uh, adequately enough to, to uh, identify people individually. So this is an ongoing process, this process of individual expression, this process of economic uh, 
what would we call it, democratization of the ability to, to mark yourself for eternity. Um, now with, with, with economic advancement, with cheap laser processes, um, we go from simple names and dates to ever more complex kinds of representations of personal identities. Uh, this young woman who's shown in, in uh, many of the stages of her life on her gravestone in, in Detroit. So the conclusion then um, is the concrete gravestones that I'm looking at and what some sense the Southern setting and the African American cemetery and the fact that there are African American cemeteries are red herrings, but they're very effective red herrings because they make us aware of the obstacles in our way to seeing this process of modernity for what it really is. That the, the cheapness and the ease of working of concrete and other kinds of new materials, to borrow the modernist phrase, make visible a modernity that's often disguised by a veil of poverty. Um, the new materials provide a means by which already existing modern personae, modern self-fashioning, are made tangibly manifest. So concrete did, in fact, produce a new landscape of modernity but it produced it in more ways and in more complex ways and in more interesting ways than the early modernist advocates imagined. Thank you. No, I haven't found any families yet. Um, I've discussed them with, with local African-American historians and uh, with local cemetery historians in some of the places, particularly Savannah. And, and uh, they hadn't thought of that, but, but they're not opposed to that, that interpretation. characterized as vernacular architecture made from concrete block in particular. And it strikes me that even into the 21st century, the issue is not so much the technology of poverty. Some of these buildings are being built by people who are very well off. Um, I can think of my step-uncle, for example, who is um, a lawyer. But it has to do with a cultural context that does not think of architecture or architect, hiring an architect, of the profession of architecture and the professionalization of um, the design of something that to them seems a, a, almost like a natural form of a house, as something that they have anything to do with. It would never have occurred to my step uncle to hire an architect to build them a house. Right. Um, he drawed in a napkin and he got some guys and they yeah. built a house. So, again, it's not an issue of financial access uh, to resources. But it does speak to access to other kinds of cultural resources that aren't financial. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us, you, is this something that you also see in the context of, of the material you're, you're working on? Yeah, I, I, um, I showed you the pictures of those, those two stores, I believe. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, uh, you're right, people would never have, think about hiring architects for this. Um, my, what I'm trying to say is they still think of themselves as modern nevertheless. And they think of themselves as modern because they are using these materials. Um, the s stores, are, stores are among the most common of these, uh, both because they're secure, but also because they suggest a kind of, you know, here you get up-to-date products and, and so on. Uh, so another place I see it, which I didn't talk about here, is in African-American churches, uh, in the sense that they're constantly being reworked with new materials. Um, so buildings that start out as wood might then be 
encased in concrete, uh, concrete blocks, and then finally encased again in brick. Um, and that sense of continuity, but also progress is there, which is indicated, uh, signaled among other things, by the fact that you have a series of cornerstones. And the cornerstones all say rebuilt. And rebuilt could mean torn down and a new one built. It could mean lightly remodeled. It could be extensively remodeled. The point being the continuity and the progress. So there are lots of southern churches, black churches that appear to be made out of brick, but that actually encase earlier wooden churches. So again, that sense of materials as modernity, materials as progress, rather than a particular image as progress. Uh, and, and I think that when I started out with those different strains of what people thought concrete could provide, and one of them was the ability of people to have, have up-to-date and modern buildings uh, easily and of their own making, I think that's th this is the fulfillment of that particular strain. Diane. Uh, so thanks for, for a great and really fascinating lecture. And I, I'm really by <coughs> the way you have circled back around to, to, to beats. And I kept thinking about small things forgotten and how this work makes us remember that there are big things to be found and small things forgotten. But also wondering about something really specific, which is just what is the geographic range of those markers that, that you're studying? And are there things that you can learn differently when you look at this at a sort of spatial range? Um, the ge the geographical range is something that I, s I want to do ultimately systematically with uh, GIS or GPS, um, just as an, exp an, an impressionistic uh, um, sense from the African-American ones. They stretch from about the level of Maryland on south. Um, they, uh, they are, of course, most heavily represented in poorer rural areas of the South. Uh, a lot of my examples that I showed today were from South Carolina or Mississippi. Um, they also are, uh, interestingly enough, and th this is, I suppose, part of the modernization and, and rationalization, you tend to find them more often in graveyards belonging to um, denominations that are associated with the black middle class rather than really poor black denominations. So AME, Baptists, uh, as opposed to Pentecostals, and so on. Um, the other thing to say about them is that uh, I think as, as significant as the geographical range is the temporal range. You know, I showed you some in New Mexico, and I showed you some in, in and, and you can actually find some from, from White Appalachia. But they last for a very short time, that kind of interregnum. African Americans started making them as early as anybody, basically the second decade of the 20th century, and they still make them. Um, you can find ones that have been made, they're almost new when you come across them. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, sort of following up on that, if there's anything that you're mentioning where the concrete plants were in relation to these, sort of the source material. But yeah. And you know, you mentioned the artists have a particular brand where they're looking at the plants and they use a local aggregate, for example, that can help replace Yeah, that's, that's to come. But yeah, concrete pl where, where the concrete plants, plants were and how, how the concrete is distributed. And also how uh, so, somebody asked earlier about whether I talked to the individual families. And, and that is one of my, uh, on my agenda is to track them down and find out if I'm right that they had a, a member of their family who was a building worker or in some way had particular access to concrete or to the, to the skills for working in concrete. There are, you know, there are ones at both ends of the spectrum. There are, there are, um, there are ones that are really, I sh the ones I showed you were among the most skillfully made, but there, there are some that are, that are clearly made by somebody who had no idea what they were doing. Somebody suggested in some of the urban areas, and this is something I'm also trying to track down, that some of the urban ones, like around Savannah, may have been sold by funeral homes. Uh, to people who couldn't afford stones. There are, around Savannah, there are a group of stones, concrete stones, that were made 
by pouring them into a mold on the ground. And you can see the shape of the earth on the back. And you can see the, the, the boards on the top uh, of, the, of the mold. They are exact reproductions of, the shapes are exact reproductions of a very common, common kind of late 18th century neoclassical gravestone. And they're made in the 1940s and 50s. And what they would do is um, when the concrete died, dried, cover it with plaster, white plaster, and inscribe the inscription into that. So most of them no longer have any inscriptions. But, uh, but those are clearly somebody producing them in some sort of quasi-commercial way. Statues as markers. Is that an accurate? Yeah. Well, a they're hard. Um, you see them in you, you see them in Quebec in Catholic graves gravestone graveyards. Um, you see little things. You see um, cast flower baskets, cast bunny rabbits, and things of that sort. The occasional very small cast cherub, but. Uh, but right, Protestants, well, except that period in the 19th century when everyone had these gaudy angels, Protestants don't tend to go for statues on their, on their, um, st on their graves. Any of my students you want to? Then, I, if I may, I have a question as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was really interesting to place this this kind of uh, cultural production or use of concrete uh, next to what is perhaps its opposite. Uh, these these large uh, panels, uh, concrete panels, right? Uh, by which in, this, in the post-war period, lots of housing had been constructed, uh, in mostly uh, by uh, large uh, large developers, large uh, firms, mm -hmm. uh, often in. Uh, with the support of, of states, right, of, of uh, nation states, with the aim of you know, large-scale national modernization. Mm -hmm. uh, so these were uh, large housing projects, right, uh, uh, in the name of, of modernization. And I think what you show is the kind of very the uh, the opposite side of uh, of that uh, of, of, of concrete of the relationship between concrete and modernity. And so my my question is. Uh, if the large panels are a sign of a kind of capitalist system uh, of centralization of expertise, centralization of production, uh, um, with in the framework of, 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 of the state, then what is the kind of uh, capitalist uh, uh, regime that you see this coming out of? Is it a kind of consumer culture that is uh, kind of on, on uh, the bottom of all of this, of, of this large-scale modernization, a, a, a consequence of that. Um, yeah, it's it's. Or a reaction to it. No, it's not a reaction to it. It is um, it is consumer culture that that um, among other things ties into the do-it-yourself culture that begins to be promoted in the late nineteenth century. Uh, and one of the things, one of the advantages of working with concrete particularly concrete blocks, is that you can accumulate them bit by bit, and they will, and you see lots of half-built concrete block buildings around. You can, you can accumulate them, and you can accumulate them over any period of time, and they won't deteriorate. You know, if you're piling up two by fours, and you leave them out there for 20 years, they're going to be fairly useless. Um, so it is that, that uh, uh, that I can go to the feed store, the, the grain store, the, um, and I can buy, I've got some money, I'll buy 10 concrete blocks and I'll put them there. So it really, uh, it is a part, it is like many efforts in, in 20th century modern architecture by high style architects who are always like Wright, who are always looking for ways to bring good architecture, however you define that, farther and farther down the scale, I think this is a way that that happened that perhaps they didn't, didn't recognize. It's why I showed you the, the Freeman House and those cast concrete blocks, because what Wright is doing 
many, many people did in a, in a more, in a less aesthetically pretentious way, but he's, he's, he, he is picking up, as he often did, on a much more widespread practice that, that we don't pay attention to. And you had another one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if, if the what you showed, so if, if I put these two together, then I, then I think we uh, these two contrasts, right? The self building and then the kind of state supply, two thousand, you know, thousands of units of, at once. Otherwise, this mode of production doesn't even make sense, mm -hmm. right? Then that would seem uh, to to really uh, give some form uh, uh, of agency, potential agency to the architects involved, right, if they were willing to see it, uh, let's say, uh, would, uh, to, to, to really think about mass, produce, mass production uh, uh, in its kind of social uh, consequences, right, whether that is uh, allows for self-building or, uh, or requires a certain kind of uh, rigid uh, capitalist system and the centralization of expertise, et cetera, right? Um, so in light of today, I think uh, a lot of or some architects may be thinking about uh, prefabrication and mass production or some ways of assembling things and how that might allow different forms of production and consumption. Is, is this something that you think uh, is a, a, a potential venue for architects to, to think about? And if so, how, how would they go about it? Well, as you know, prefabrication is an elusive dream among architects. Um, in fact, what I was thinking as you were talking, um, the way you were, you were putting it, you have these mass-produced concrete houses, the, the, the top of the feed chain, and you have the smaller, often self-built concrete houses at the bottom of the feed chain. And I think that throws the individual single-family wooden or, or brick house into a new light because it's really a choice not to participate in that kind of mass production at both the top and the, and the bottom of, of the industry. Or, you know, in, uh, architects are always railing against the, the inefficiency of the, the, the handmade house, but it becomes a kind of choice like artisan bread or something. You know, it becomes a, a middle class choice uh, a way to distinguish oneself from that larger, um, from that that, lar that that larger force which is pushing toward industrialized building. Um, whether whether our, whether that's an, an avenue for architects, I think that's what Wright was trying to do. Um, he didn't, it, and as you know, he had many many attempts at various forms of prefabrication. But I think um, what he was trying to do was to, to tie into both the self-building and the desire, the, the architect's desire for visual good design, quote unquote. Um, I don't think it can ever, that, at least history suggests that it can never, never succeed on any other than a, say, component scale. You know, Martha Stewart at Target or something. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh